Hello, hello, everybody. We are just getting things ready here um, for our event with the cast of Promised Land. Hey, Rodrigo. Hey, Santiago. Hey, Danai. How are you? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm great. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rodrigo. No, I was just going to say hi to everybody. Really, really excited uh, uh, to be part of this uh, conversation. I, I love the show. And when uh, Santiago and you invited me to be part of it, I was uh, elated. So really happy to be here. So quick question. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm like, I'm so happy uh, that we're doing this room because this show is so badass. Like it's such an awesome show. Um, so I know Santiago because actually Santiago turned me on to it. Were you watching it before we started talking about it or did you hear about it from us? I, I had watched the first episode and like a portion of the second one. I didn't give it that much like importancia. And, uh, but I loved it from the first go round. And, and, uh, but I just, you know, I just didn't get around to it. So when Santiago and you obviously told me more about it, I was just like, wow, man, let me, let me invest in it. And the show is amazing. And I'm so happy to see that John, uh, Mr. John Ortiz is here with us. Uh, how's it going, John? How are you doing today? John, uh, there's a microphone on the lower right-hand corner. If you could just press that, just so we can hear you. There you go. There you go. How's it going, guys? Bienvenido, 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 John. How are you? Gracias. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, Welcome. Hey. Hi, guys. This is my first clubhouse, so I'm uh, very excited and nervous. Well, we are thrilled to have you. Uh, we opened up the room a little bit early just to get everything set up. So we're just going to kind of chat about, we've just been like chatting about how much we love the show really um, while we wait for everybody to jump in here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, it's really uh, so nice to hear such positive uh, reactions from you guys. So I really appreciate that. I'm really proud of the show, and um, so uh, I take it to heart. No, and it's a show that everybody here, uh, we've been talking about it a lot lately in our in our rooms, um, in the hallways here. We've been generating a lot of buzz, and, um, you know, as I as I started seeing you sharing the, the show more and more on your social media, that's when I, you know, I really started paying attention to it, and after like 20 minutes into that episode that first episode i i just said man everybody's got to watch this show so um you know we're really really excited to have you here and you know can't wait to have the rest of the crew come in thank you i appreciate that hopefully they'll uh hopefully they won't have too much trouble getting on it was pretty simple so oh here's rolando Hey, Rolando, welcome. So, Rolando, on the bottom right, and we're probably going to have to go through this with a few people. We we onboarded a few of you guys, but not everybody. So, uh, hey, look, there's Bellamy. Okay, so on the bottom right of your screen, you're going to see a microphone icon. So when, you're spe when you want to speak, you just hit that, and that's going to unmute you. And then when you stop speaking, you can hit it again, and it'll go ahead and mute you. Perfect. So this works. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Welcome, welcome. And welcome, Bellamy. Hello, love. Thanks again for the help earlier. I'm on. Hey, you guys, in case you, uh, so you don't get a call during our thing, put it on uh, flight mode and use your Wi-Fi. I love it. I love it. Um, and Matt, welcome to the stage. Just in case, uh, Matt, if you're looking for the button, it's on the bottom right. I just found it. <laughs> <laughs> not, a Thank problem, you guys. not a problem. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and chat just a couple minutes while we wait for everybody else to come in. Um, so again, if you are 
not speaking, you can go ahead and hit that button and mute yourself. I went ahead and muted you, Matt, real quickly, just so that um, uh, you can see that. And then when you're gonna go ahead and speak, you can hit that button again and unmute yourself uh, and so forth and so on. So welcome guys to the Amigos Club. This is the largest Latino community on the Clubhouse platform. We're over 30, 37,000 members uh, strong and our one deal really is to elevate Latino projects, the Latino community, to bring conversations about things like representation in Hollywood, um, and just to support projects because, you know, we all, all of us, every single one of us um, that I can remember uh, being in a room with has complained about, you know, not enough representation and not enough projects that show, you know, who we really are. And so when we see project, projects like this, which are exactly what we want, uh, you know, it's, I feel like it's our duty to make sure that we celebrate these projects, that we let everybody know and that we support them. And so that's why we're having this event because we really, really, you know, wanted to get the word out and um, we wanted to invite you guys and just talk to you about the project and what it means to you and your characters and all that fun stuff. So I want to, um, you know, welcome you all again. I see Katya has joined us. Katya, hello, how are you? Katya, if you're looking for the microphone, it's on the lower right-hand corner, so you can unmute, so we could hear you. Oh, hey, hi. I'm actually, I'm here with Augusto Aguilera as well. Hey, I'm trying to sign on right now. Hey. Great. So we'll wait for you to uh, to get on here as well, Augusto. And I Thank you. I, I'm so bad at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And I believe we are waiting for one more or two more people. No, we are waiting for two people because we have um, uh, Donatiu. Right? Am I saying that right, guys? Come, Tona. That's yes, correct. I believe so. Yes. We, we usually call him Tona, but yes, Donatiu is correct. Nailed it. Awesome. <laughs> you usually don't get him right the first time, deny. That's great. I always. All right, thank you very much. I'm so impressed, and I. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, so we're waiting for Tonatiu, and then I believe we're also waiting for Michael Jones Morales, uh, who should be joining us as well uh, in this room. Well, if you don't mind, and I can ask just like a kind of a kind of, I don't want to call it icebreaker question because I hate that. But, you know, there was, I mean, obviously it's about a, you know, a wine, uh, you know, home, uh, wine country and a company heritage house and whatnot. How much wine did y'all drink? I mean, was there like a lot of wine drinking going on? And and if, if you don't want to answer that question because of liability issues or anything like that, to anybody really, what is your favorite wine? What what wine do you prefer? I'm I'm a Pinot Noir guy. I don't, I don't know uh, what anybody else, John Rolando Bellamy. Katya or Matt, what, what's y'all's favorite wines? Uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing how little, how few wine drinkers there are in the show. Aguto, I think you drink wine. Uh, I do. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of embarrassing. Like, we've been asked this question. Um, I remember they asked us at the TCAs, and it, <laughs> it was sort of crickets. Um, I don't know, you'd think it would... I don't know, be mandatory. But um, I, I, when I do drink wine, I tend to drink uh, dry sort of wines. Uh, Pinot Noir is good, stuff like that. And uh, I have to say, there uh, allegedly, there are more tequila drinkers than wine drinkers in the cast. We know what allegedly means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We, we know what that means. <laughs> And I wish I could say that on set we get to, you know, go method, but mostly we're drinking either really sweet grape juice or uh, non-alcoholic wine, which is, for me, slightly better. Although they did have a non-alcoholic um, champagne one night for one scene that was delicious, but sadly we don't usually get to partake at work. So that's one misconception that's already been shot down. I. I... Truly, I, I could just imagine all y'all just having a great time opening all these barrels of wine, but that's not what's going on. All right. 
<laughs> and I just I just want to confirm, uh, Augusto, is that you down below? Oh, there he is. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay. How, how, oh, there's a reverb. Yeah, so, since both of y'all are in the same room, it's going to catch up. It's going to catch both of y'all's uh, voices. So, uh, yeah. I just want to make sure that you're both, uh, either one person's on mic and the other person's off mic or so, or so forth. Okay. I think we figured it out. What if I just mute my mic? Does that work? No, because what happens is since you're there, you're still going to be hearing the room <laughs> happening while oh, you're kidding. speaking. <laughs> Go to the kitchen. <laughs> you guys have to separate. <laughs> Go hide in the bathroom or the bedroom. <laughs> it's like, I usually do what I do. Okay, Rodrigo. Mama's banishing him to the kitchen. <laughs> I have to say, though, even though we weren't consuming alcohol on set, the amount of fun that we would have together on there, I, f I feel like anyone would probably think that we were partying and having a good time. You know, th the other night I um, I tuned into uh, Bellamy, Rolando, and, and, and Tona's uh, live, and I just, I was cracking up when he was mentioning that uh, him and Julio Macias were just going around one day, uh, making clucking noises and i was just you know i could only imagine because somebody asked about the blooper reels how much uh fun that would be i would probably be in like another whole episode of just bloopers and and um outtakes from your show yes there was a lot of uh not drinking probably you would think we were drinking fun around the set <laughs> you know and i think that's what makes it special that you guys have that chemistry like it's it's almost family like and I think that transcends into the onto the screen, and I think it just blends and, and meshes all your characters so well. Where um, it just sh it shows up in, in what we're seeing in the art. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, and also thank you for tuning into the Instagram live, man. I appreciate that seeing us being silly on that platform as well. Yeah, I mean, I gotta say that with the. Uh with the thing about having a good time, like, you know, most of the times, uh, you can only have good times that are like that genuine with people you like, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I would go as far as saying that there's like real love, um, between all of us. And, and, uh, and, and that was something that I don't think anyone took for granted, you know, or took it lightly, you know, like as much fun as we had and how appreciative we were of it. Like, at least from my perspective, it just doesn't happen. You know, like you get these many people <laughs> in a room, chances are that, you know, there's going to be like some not good times. <laughs> and, uh, and that just wasn't the case from like day one, which was like amazing. Like the first day we met, um, and it was like, we felt like a family and we just took it from there and rolled with it. I love this. Okay, guys. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and get started. And if the other two members join us, then we'll have them, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce them as well. So this is the format that we're going to have. We're going to introduce everybody. Um, and then we are going to, op we're going to start uh, with our questions from the moderators. And then we'll bring up the audience um, and do some Q&A from the audience. But first, I just wanted to welcome everybody again. Uh, you know, this is a, a fireside chat style talk with the cast and production of Promised Land. We love this show. We've been talking about it nonstop. Uh, Promised Land, for those who don't know, is an epic generation spanning drama about two Latino families vying for wealth and power in California, Sonoma Valley. Um, I like to call it, it's like dynasty, but Mexican American and so much mejor. So before we get started, we're gonna go ahead and take turns introducing our guests. I just wanted to do something that we always do. And that is, we always give everybody our warm amigos welcome. And so everybody that's in the audience, uh, if you wanna come up and join us real quickly, we're gonna send you back down but I definitely want to make sure that we all get a chance to go ahead and give everybody that welcome. So uh, here we go. Are you guys ready? Yes, we are. 
Let's do it. So everybody at the count of three, let's unmike and give our warm amigos welcome to the cast and crew of Promised Land. One, two, and three. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. We, do, we give that a warm amigos welcome to the new uh, folks on stage. So you guys are more than deserving of that. So thank you so much. Um, and quickly, before we get too far ahead, there's a young lady here who uh, put us onto the show even before I came about it. And that's Christina. She's one of our uh, one of our, of our amigos here who is a super fanatic of the show. So I just, again, John, Rolando Bellamy, Augusto, Katia, Matt, Christina there. She's the last one here. Uh, she actually... Brought, brought promised land to us before any any one of us mentioned it. So, Christina, uh, this one's for you, man. Thank you. Yeah, I love the show. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to go ahead and take turns introducing our guests here, and then we'll just jump right in uh, to the question. So we're going to go in order. Uh, the first guest that we have on the stage is Mr. John Ortiz, who is a stage TV and film actor, producer, director for 30 years. Uh, he stars as the Sandoval family patriarch, Joe Sandoval, a vintner married to Leti, Cecilia Suarez, and with whom he shares a blended family of their respective children from a prior marriage and a son who is biologically their own. And he's a co-founder, co-artistic director with Philip Seymour Hoffman for 21 years of Labyrinth Theater Company. Some of his numerous favorite projects include Carlitos Way, Jack Goes Boating, American Gangster, Silver Linings Playbook, Pride and Glory, NARC, Fast and the Furious, Skull Island, Lu sorry, Luck, Messiah, Handmaid's Tale, and togetherness among others. He's originally from Brooklyn, New York, and resides in Santa Monica with his wife and son. Bienvenido, John. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. It's it's really great to be here. Fantastic. We, we, we're really happy to have you here, uh, John. And uh, next up is Mr. Rolando Chusan, who plays Billy a worker on the Heritage House Vineyard in the Sonoma Valley. Billy dreams of one day owning the vineyard and has an immediate spark with Juana, Katya Martin, launching an intense rivalry with Billy's brother, Carlos, who is also in love with her. Chusan is a writer whose work has been performed at the Labyrinth Theater Company's Barnyard Series, the Ecuadorian American Cultural Center, and most recently on a theatrical project via Zoom sponsored by the Tank NYC for a COVID-19 relief charity nine hugs he is a proud ecuadorian immigrant and a dreamer of humble humble origins who is the proud son of a factory worker turned social worker mother and a security guard turned teaching assistant father saludos mr rolando bow, 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 bow. hola <laughs> what's up y'all and up next i have the pleasure of introducing the wonderful the beautiful uh, miss bellamy young most of us know an acclaimed actress and singer bellamy young from her award-winning role as president Melly. Grant on ABC, Shonda Rhimes, Peabody Award winning series, Scandal. I know you guys remember that show. She now starts opposite John Ortiz in Promised Land as a scheming and possibly misunderstood villainous ex-wife, Margaret Honeycroft, or as we call her, La Honeycroft, um, who is a hotel magnet and longtime nemesis of vineyard owner, Joe Samoval, played by Mr. John Ortiz. In addition to playing Jessica Whitley on Prodigal Son and Melly Grant on Scandal, Young's TV credits includes Criminal Minds, Scrubs, and Guest Spots on Fantasy Island, Whiskey Cavalier, Castle, and more. Miss Bellamy Young also starred in the feature The Walton's Homecoming, a remake of the 1971 film that led to TV's beloved Walton series. Hi, hi everybody. I'm so happy to be here and so excited for tonight. So happy to have you here. Okay. So I'm gonna go and introduce Matt Lopez. So Matt Lopez is actually the mastermind behind this amazing story. He is a film and TV writer and producer and creator and showrunner of Promised Land. Other projects include the upcoming Father of the Bride, a reboot of the classic film franchise for Plan B and Warner Brothers, the family comedy Alexander for Disney Plus, and Wrath, sorry, Wraith, a horror thriller for Netflix. Matt also created and executive produced the television series Gone. 
Other credits include Jerry Bruckheimer's The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Race to Witch Mountain, starring Dwayne Johnson, and the Walt Disney comedy Bedtime Story, starring Adam Sandler. Matt came to writing and producing after a successful career as an attorney and business affairs executive for DreamWorks, where he worked on such features as Gladiator, American Beauty, and Saving Private Ryan. Bienvenido, Matt. Gracias. Mucho gusto. So excited to be here. Thank you for having us. We're really excited to have you here, Matt, as well. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. Uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce Ms. Katia Martin, who plays Juana Sanchez, a young woman from Mexico who, in 1987, crosses the border into California with her sister Rosa, fighting to find work to save money and put herself through school to attain the dream of becoming a teacher. Uh, Katia just wrapped up the feature film Death That Awaits, directed by Richard G. J. Lee and written by Rachel Kiley where she plays the lead role. Her credits include BBC's Roadkill with Hugh Laurie, Lifetime's 10, opposite Dylan Arnold, Showtime's The Affair with Dominic West and Ruth Wilson, and My First Miracle with Sean Patrick Flannery. Katia, welcome to the stage. Bow, 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 bow. Hola, muchas gracias. So up next, we have Augusto Aguilera. So I guess there's a trend I'm seeing here because Rolando's Ecuadorian as well. And Augusto Galera, Ecuadorian-born American actor, best known for his roles in The Predator and uh, Too Old to Die Young. He plays Mateo, and I really love Mateo's character, man. I mean, Mateo Flores, he's the son of La Leti uh, and, and Billy, or as we like to call <laughs> Carlos Rincón. I'm sorry, uh, Billy Rincón. Uh, so, yeah, he's, he's an uh, Ecuadorian-born actor, uh, grew up in Los Angeles, California, began his serious acting career at the Actors Circle Theater when he was 20. Uh, he eventually made the transition to acting on film, which he found strange to begin with. And quote of quote, he said, I've heard that the theater is an actor's medium, film a director's, TV a writer's. Initially, I believe collaboration only came in film and theater. Now I know it's on the director. With the theater, there are no safety nets. It's an emotional marathon. So welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, Augusto Aguilera, to the stage. Hey, thanks. Um... How did you find all that stuff about me? That's insane. It's okay, brother. I'm a former federal officer, and uh, I'm also Peruvian, so I know how to stalk people. <laughs> those, those Peruvians, man. You gotta be careful with them, man. Mm, nice. So, I, I'm, a little, I, I'm a little jelly. There's two Ecuadorians on the show, so it's all good, though. I love you guys. <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be more of us. Yes, yes. And so... Close. I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's jump right in. Before we start asking our questions again, remember, we're going to spend about the first 30 minutes asking questions from the mods, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, we do ask that while you're in here listening, if you don't mind sharing the room so that we can get more of our people in here, that would be awesome. And so here's my first question, uh, and I'm going to direct it to Matt. Um, so, and this is a question that I'm, I'm, I always ponder myself. I was very pleasantly surprised at the fact that the issue of Latinidad actually comes up in the show, um, and it's during a part where some of the characters discuss an event. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, you know, bring in any spoilers. So I'm going to be very vague about the 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 actual uh, scene. But uh, in the event, they do bring up the issue of representing all Latinos, and it wasn't you know not just the Mexican American culture, but they they referenced a bunch of other different Latino cultures. And it struck me because we discussed this idea probably several times a week, if not daily in our club, um, because we're always talking about, you know, the unity that we can represent without taking away from the individual diversity of every single Latino culture. And so can you explain how that scene came about, what you hope it communicates, what, you know, what, how did it happen? Where did you come up with that scene? Uh, I know the scene you're th you're talking about. Uh, it's something that I've felt and observed for a while, just being in the trenches in Hollywood for as long as I've been. And as you guys know better than anyone, there are, you know, every year or every couple of years, there's a big push to get, quote unquote, Latino content or Latinx content, whatever you want to call it, on the air, in theaters and so on. I've, I've always found, you know, it's, it's funny, like, I remember once when I was still a business affairs exec slash uh, lawyer for DreamWorks, uh, they used to give us 
lunch down uh, there at the at the studio over in in, in Glendale, and my assistant uh, came upstairs one day, <laughs> and she said, "They have your people's food down there," uh, and I was like. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, there was no bad intent on her part. She thought it was innocent, but I, my immediate first thought was, cause I'm Cuban American. I was, I thought to myself, if I go down there and there's Papa Relleno down there, I'm going to be stunned. So let me go see what she thinks my people's food is. <laughs> so I went down there and it was a tostada bar. Uh, and I wanted to tell her, by the way, that's not even Mexican food. That's American food. <laughs> um, but you know, it's. It illustrates a point that I have felt that, and, and it's funny that that phrase, your people, comes up again in our season finale, uh, which will drop in a couple of weeks, and I'm super excited about. Um, it, you know, I think we rightly love to focus as Latinos on, we take great pride in our individual roots and our individual places of origin and we bristle at the fact i know i did for a long time that like i think we're viewed as a monoculture or or a monolith of some kind like oh we're all the same either culturally politically like whatever it is and so i think we've done a great job uh as latinos I know I've always tried to do of like, oh no, we're different, we're different, like, you know, and that's great to a degree. What I was trying to do in that scene was I think sometimes in our rush to, like I said, rightfully tout our own individual cultures and the uniqueness of those cultures and places of origin, I, I feel like sometimes we overlook our commonalities and it's not just it's not just the language um it's it's these bonds it's a family it's it's a culture it's you know in some cases it's religion but not all cases but there is this thing that binds us and i wanted to just kind of speak up for that you know there was a there was a brief moment in time when we were casting the show where i told the casting director look, it's a Mexican-American family. Let's straight up try and cast it with Mexican-Americans and go for real authenticity. And because, as you see, the cast is quite large, and this is like probably less than half of it, <laughs> uh, it just from a sheer actor availability standpoint, it was like immediately apparent, like, oh, this is going to be hard to do. So then I told her, let's just cast the best Latinos, irrespective of country of origin, and or what their roots are and it ended up being a blessing because we have the whole latino diaspora represented in the cast of this show there's cubans there's he as you said two ecuadorians there's you know españoles from 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 the mother country there's south americans central americans north americans i like to say john ortiz is from the latin american republic of brooklyn um you know it, <laughs> it, and it it brought us together in this amazing way and i know just separate and apart from the show i think just speaking personally for me in my life it i felt that commonality and i felt those bonds of family with other Latinos from other different places in a way that I never had before. What a great response. And, and the show definitely shows that when it comes to the commonalities. And there's another scene, and I'll, I'll actually ask about that scene later on, but thank you so much, Matt, for that uh, uh, great response because it is important to showcase that. Uh, with that said, I, I do wanna ask about, uh, to, to Mr. John Ortiz regarding his character because one of my favorite scenes is when uh, when Joe is being chastised by his daughter Veronica, who's uh, portrayed by Christina Ochoa, and uh, and John base and and Joe basically goes ham, and he le da sabor uh, to his speech, and he gives the attitude that the moment deserved, chastising the white folks for their mediocrity and no longer being a pushover. I, I wanted to ask John directly. Your, your character Joe is so complex. He, he's progressive in some ways, like when he does listen to his daughter at that time. And, and and accepting his own son his uh his son's orientation but also conservative you know and, and he gives off that machismo quite quite a bit during the show even going fisticuffs with uh, father ramos who's played by you uh, vasquez you know he says Orale, tu y yo, vámonos. 
Uh, how do you find that balance, John, when you portray a character that's uh, still relatable, but so elaborate in, in uh, their, their composition? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I have to say it first starts with the writing. Um, it, it's uh, like 90, 99% of it is there. And um, I, I, you know, I didn't have that much time to conjure up my own <laughs> take <laughs> on stuff. Like I just had to like, you know, dive in, right? And just make sure I have every beautiful word that was written uh, at the tip of my uh, tongue, you know, ready to come out. And there was some emotional truth to what was happening. Um, but uh, specifically with your question, you know, um, yeah, I found I found Joe. I love Joe. I love how com complex he is. And um, I love his journey, right? And my first question that I, cause it's it like, even Joe's journey is epic, you know, um, uh, that track that he has from when, you know, you first see him uh, crossing the border to when you meet uh, my version of Joe. Um, and my, uh, one of my first questions to Matt was, you know, because it's so extreme from where he starts to where he ends up was how much of how much of those roots does are still intact um, culturally, like uh, uh, personality wise, you know, um, um, and how much of those roots that we see that are pretty strong. And I got to give it up to Andres, who would be here because he's amazing. Um, but he's traveling overseas right now, and um, he's just so amazing and so vibrant, um, his characterization of, of young Joe. But it's so clear, and it's so endearing, and it's like, but, you know, like in life, things change, and, 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 and things change drastically for Joe. So I didn't want, you know, the question of, like, success and money for the most part, there's some cost that comes. And even on a meta level, you know, at what cost do your dreams, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, are sacrificed, you know? And, 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 um, and so, and so I, I, I wanted to lean pretty hard on the, side that you're describing as conservative and old school and and perhaps um not so uh uh idealistic you know um and then and 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 to me that personally spoke to you know the 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 uh the question of assimilation you know of like when you know i I grew up in a poor neighborhood and I remember just even going from neighborhoods to neighborhood in the Latin Republic of Brooklyn. Uh, um, there was, uh, there was a great deal of assimilation that I had to do. And I had to like, you know, kind of, kind of, um, be flexible, you know, for survival sake. Now, Joe's a guy who's like being, you know, flexible, in a ambitious, direct, pragmatic way for success, you know, in a capitalistic uh, 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 tip, you know, and so, and so I, and so I really wanted to like examine that. And so when, so when there were moments like that speech that come up, you know, um, because to me, doing that would present obstacles that were real and interesting right um and so and so like in that speech what happens in be, uh, before that speech i think what sparks that speech because if joe woke up in the morning and just rattled off that speech or had that speech prepared it wouldn't be as interesting as if 
what really happened, which was he wasn't planning on giving that speech. He was planning on giving the speech he's been giving for the past 25 years, which is, you know, pretty much the white man's speech, right? And, 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 and the businessman's speech and, and the kind of speech that, you know, makes you uh, go up a couple of uh, levels in the ladder of success in this, you know, um, in this particular world. But that doesn't happen. And, and the reason why it doesn't happen is because the daughter he raised taught him a lesson and, and, and made him confront something that he's been having, that he's had his blinders to um, in order to achieve the success. And when he notices that, when he realizes that, and through what, seeing her, and 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 he he then digs deep and and goes into what we see Andres do in his earlier years and so and so having access to both of those things both of uh, both of those sides um, of as you describe woke versus old school um, is uh, incredibly exciting and so much fun to play with. Awesome, awesome. And thank you for that response, John. I appreciate that. And we just saw that uh, Donatillo just joined us. So Donatillo, hey. welcome to the stage, brother. Hey, hey. Happy to be here. No, thank you for joining us. So I just quickly uh, want to introduce you before we move on to our next question. Uh, with more than a decade of experience on stage screen and in the vocal booth, Donatillo is an actor screenwriter, screenwriter who currently plays Antonio Sandoval, the oldest of the five children of the Sandoval family. Good. Antonio has been living in New York. And after being cast into exile by his father, Joe, after coming out as gay, but he is called back into the fold when he, the family faces a threat from the outside. Whether Antonio has forgiven or forgotten the treatment he received from his family remains an open question. Additional television and streaming credits, including a major recurring guest star role on the forthcoming Peacock limited series, Angeline, as well as a three season recurring guest star arc in the Glad Media award winning star series, Vida, where Donatillo Tona played the gender bending Marco Zamora, which landed him on the cover of the LA Times calendar section in May 2020. So welcome to the stage, Tona. How are you? I'm doing great. And just for clarification, I'm the second oldest, but the oldest male of the Sandoval children. That's right. Yeah, you're <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> my apologies, my apologies. No, no worries. <laughs> so I guess my next question, um, it's not directed towards anyone in particular. It's just, I guess, um, for anyone who, who likes to answer, um, what is... You know, and again, you know, there's so many themes that this show hits. What theme personally resonated with you? And I only ask this because as the show is progressing, I can see how many of us have gone through La Lucha of the American Dream, but how many of us can actually say that they did it, they did it while living, quote unquote, in the shadows? So again, that's my question to the crew and the cast. Okay, well, uh, I'm just gonna jump in to get the ball rolling. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the question was, uh, what theme resonated with us the most? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, so for me, I, I, I had the privilege, or I guess the honor of being able to show uh, the trauma that a queer person faces when their family betrays them. And, um, the internalization, the internal homophobia, the internalization of that betrayal and thus becoming a betrayer yourself. I think that thematically, um, that didn't personally hit home. My family was very accepting, um, but it was it was challenging to hold and to hold that truth to sh and to showcase it um, and to live with it for a few months. Um, I can't begin to imagine the amount of like pain that is still happening to queer youth right now, especially with what's going on with uh, in Texas and in Florida. And I think there's a I've read an article that over a hundred different states, or I mean a hundred different uh, legislative bills are being passed that are uh, anti LGBTQ at the moment. But um, yeah, it was it was a bit of a challenge to recognize and reopen some wounds um, to be able to present that. And um, this past episode was something, was a gift play uh, because we saw some redemption. 
and some healing for Antonio that I don't think we had seen earlier in the season. That's amazing. And I, you know, you really just answered questions that we were going to have for you specifically. <laughs> we were, we yeah. were texting each other like, wait a second. <laughs> well, <sighs> I'm done. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mic drop. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We're done. <laughs> that is all. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and go with a totally different question. Um, uh, I, I, if I may, I, I, I'll jump into the uh, previous question before as well. Uh, absolutely, inspired absolutely. by uh, by the ball being rolled. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, when I first read the script, like the idea, at least in the past timeline, for me, when I when I read it, like even before I got the role, like I remember crying because I'm an immigrant. You know, my parents are immigrants. I was born in Ecuador. I came here when I was like three. And uh, the kind of like fairy taleness and joy that was for me presented in the script was so beautiful from the get-go. Like, I think so many stories present us, um, you know, the hardships of immigration, which is so true and, and so relatable for a lot of people. But um, there's also joy and there's also this uh, magic of achievement that comes when you first like step into the the, the country and uh, you know, and the writers I think did a great job at like presenting these like this part of the humanity within that, um, you know, Billy, Joe, and Letty like for all their hardships are having, you know, a you know a good time like they they love each other and they're doing all this uh you know all this growing, um, and then you know being being uh, juxtaposed with uh, the future timeline and how much money doesn't necessarily mean happiness and doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna, you know, uh, all your problems are solved, I think was uh, a really beautiful part for me. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and kind of adding adding on to that, if, if I may just real quickly, I think one of the exciting things that we've, we've talked about in our timeline with Rolando and Andres and I of how it's yes this is an immigrant story but at, at least in i think i think this is mainly comes up in the past timeline that it's really a coming of age story and you really get to see these three young characters just start building a life for themselves and discover what what they love what they don't love what their dreams are um and they are essentially building their own their own life and their own family and exploring that that the coming of age, the family building, that was really exciting for me as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Katia. Okay, gente, we are going to move on to the next question. And by the way, at any point, uh, if anybody on the panel wants to jump in and answer a question or you know, add on to something somebody else said, please feel free to jump in. If you wanna flash your mic, that'll let us know that you do want to say something and so that way um i don't cut you guys off like i just did twice in a row um so okay uh my next question is for bellamy bellamy your character margaret honeycroft starts off really hateable and as any great character does she evolves into someone the audience starts to understand and dare i say roots for especially with regards to her relationships with the rest of her family. Um, and you, uh, you absolutely do this brilliantly. So my question to you is, what about her do you think is the most misunderstood and how do you tackle communicating that as the, act, as the character? Oh, thank you so much for that. And I just want to say thanks for having us here tonight and having this conversation. I see some familiar faces. I'm sending love to everybody. I'm new to Clubhouse entirely, which will surprise no one. But I've been so, I've learned so much and been so moved by uh, the conversation we're already having. So thank you. Um, and thank you for the question. Uh, you know, it's Matt you know it's all born of Matt's beautiful brain and it's all always on the page so uh trusting the journey is 
what drew me in. You ask about like thematically what called us to the project. I was I got to join late. Uh, someone else was playing this function in the narrative, um, but they decided to make it Joe's ex instead. And so I had the joy of watching the opus, which was the pilot, watching all this beautiful work from from word to performance to cinematography to all of it. And I was struck that, I struck in a little, um, you know, ashen that I realized I'd never seen this story, a story of following the American dream, star, a story of just an honest immigration story told in a human way instead of politicized, instead of, you know, all the negative negative added to it or just statistics, numbers, blah, blah, just the human story told of someone following their dreams and what, it, as John said, what it costs, what it earns, uh, where it leads, how it surprises, um, I couldn't believe how lucky I was to get to come into this family. And then my first conversation with Matt uh, over Zoom, because life's been like that. Uh, Matt and Maggie Molina are, uh, are also executive producer. Um, we talked a lot about that, like who's Margaret, where's she been? Why'd she go? And why is she back? And uh, it was so lovely to think of her as the villain in the story because she's coming back to grab her vineyard back. But oh, it's just so much more. And that's the, that wonderful messiness is what always draws any actor. You know, we're like moths to the flame of chaos. We just want to be in there and it'd be like, mm, but like pigs in dirt. You know, it's, oh, it's so messy. Um, and she's back, hasn't seen her children in 20 years. We think, what a horrible person. And then we start to learn how and why that happened and how hard she's worked to prove herself and to get her self-confidence back to to the point where she could even look in the direction of Sonoma again, much less take that first step. And then as she wades into the waters, you know, first with Antonio and, you know, trying to, you know, sort of woo Veronica, which that is a much harder sell and uh, coming at Carmen through her art and it never being, um, it never being nefarious because it's all coming out of love. She loves, well, she loved that vineyard, of course. It was her heart, it was her home, but she loves her family. And I think, you know, we eventually come to find out that leaving decimated her and that, you know, she she wasn't this ogre that was hiding in the woods, sort of like rubbing her hands together and cackling all these years. She was literally off trying to pick herself off the floor and be worthy of trying to return. So as we see her, my cat agrees, uh, as we see her go through all she's been through coming back to Sonoma, um, you know, there is no one out there. We've all failed and fled on a smaller or large, larger scale. And it's something like heroic in a very small way to turn around and face that shame and uh, try and make amends. And so I hope, I, I don't know, that's what I find in Matt's story. And that's what resonates with me and what I try and um, invite people. Like that's the journey I try to invite people on because she also, like she had a great, uh, that great first scene with Carmen when they're having lunch, bless her heart, Carmen thinks she's gonna meet um, someone who, you know, a marketer that wants to represent her art turns out to be her long lost mother. Um, Margaret gives her, you know, some information and she's like, if this is an apology, it needs work. And Margaret, <laughs> what'd you wait? What was it? La Honeycroft uh, says in return, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not asking for your forgiveness. I just want you to understand. And I think that's how she's come back to Sonoma. I'm, I know what I did. I own what I did. I'm not asking for your forgiveness, but I want you to understand. And I want, well, I want Margaret's version of justice. Dun, dun, dun. I love that. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Yo, and if y'all have not watched the show, I'm going to tell everybody right now that's in the mezzanine, that's in the audience, please, y'all, go to Hulu right now. If you don't have a Hulu account, 
you have a friend that has a Hulu account, set up a profile and go in there and like the show. It is on there. You can binge watch all the episodes that are out there. There's more episodes that are coming out, but please check it out because to uh, Bellamy and to John, Rolando, Matt, Katya, Agosto, and, and Tona, the, 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 the drama there, the, the collective chaos, if you will, is amazing, yet they still intertwine all these very pertinent, relevant issues that are affecting our Latinidad, our community, and nuestra gente. It's really an amazing show how they've been able to interweave all these different plots, all these lines, but not shy away from those tough topics. So yes, please go out there right now, go to your Hulu account, log, log in, and make sure you at least like it, put it on your saved, and make sure that you watch it because it is an amazing show. Thank you so much, Bellamy, for that. And, and, and just, just, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, to be fair to, uh, you know, the, the character of Margaret Honeycroft, I think two out of the eight episodes so far, their cliffhangers have been with her character. So go ahead, Rodrigo. Oh yeah, especially that last one, right? I'm not gonna tell anybody what The it last is, one, right? dude, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> she set that up perfectly, like, like the very Montgomery Burns, like, you know, I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? But. <laughs> But uh, I know you're telling me I'm over here like Antonio, like, what's gonna happen next, Margaret? What's gonna happen next, Margaret? <laughs> Let's call her a catalyst. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I know I know I'm a bit biased, but we've got the best cliffhangers. Honey, let our number one. Our number one is like no other. So it comes from the top. You and Matt, our dual number ones. That, that, thank y'all so much. And y'all, again, please go to Hulu, check it out. Look, you know, don't just listen to what we're talking about. Watch it on TV on Hulu. Uh, I want to continue this discussion about blended families. You know, uh, that's another great facet of the show and how it portrays how families really are nowadays, right? Blended and mixed and full of intricate relationships. As we were talking right now, Bellamy was sharing how, you know, Margaret is a fascinating portrayal of a woman because uh, she's either being wronged by her family or what, or was what was wrong with the family, right? Just depending on who you ask. And uh, Mattel is another character that is also striving to be himself, and, and but but he's also likely also trying to find himself, right? And so, Agosto, uh, to, to, uh, this question is for you. What what was challenging about your role, uh, and how important was it to portray that burden of being quote unquote that other child, and and, and something that really is commonplace now, uh, a theme that that really strikes accord with so many folks when we have these blended families mixed families that come about how, how did you uh, go into this role to prepare for that um that's a great question i uh i i i'd like to answer a little bit of the last question about the themes that kind of attracted me to this because i think that they pair up pretty um pretty succinctly uh the thing about Mateo and the theme within his story that I thought was really interesting and it was kind of subtly written in there is this idea that happens a lot I think with like first and second generation Latinos here in the United States where their their families their parents have gone through this entire journey to get us here and oftentimes before we're even born. So just the idea of giving their future children an opportunity that they didn't have from where they came from. And I think that that is not just um, a, a solely a Latino thing, but I think it's pervasive across all immigrant families here in the United States. And after going through this, this gigantic journey to get us to where uh, they feel like the most opportunity is um, something I think really interesting happens, which is that uh, you can only dream so big when your life is so oppressed. When you have so few opportunities, your dreams can only be um, as big as the opportunities presented to you. And so oftentimes I think our parents, they have dreams and aspirations for us that are smaller than what the American dream actually can afford us. And I found that Mateo saw a bigger, uh, a bigger world than even uh, Joe or uh, Letty had seen for him. So when they say at the beginning of the show, they say, hey, this is, this is good enough. Just being a vineyard manager is good enough. 
like you shouldn't be anything more. It was really, really reminiscent to me uh, when my parents were like, you've got to be just like, just be a lawyer or be, do something safe. You know, we work this hard to get you here. Like just kind of collect your, your, your opportunity there and just do something safe and don't dream so big because, um, because it's a little bit more uh, risky to do so. And so I found that the theme for Mateo was that to, to kind of, to prove to other people that you are more than you, uh, than you're looked at. And now to the blended family of it all, I found that it linked really, really well to that because um, I, I'd heard, I, I did a lot of research. I don't come from a blended family myself. I, I have a lot of friends that had, and they told me a lot of their stories, but I did find this, this one, um, this one stepfather who, who was talking on YouTube, who I, I, I won't name mostly because I don't remember, but also because he said some awful things. But what he was talking about was, um, being the stepfather to, uh, one kid when he also had four other kids and he would talk about how he felt like he was wasting resources by raising this other child by rearing this other child someone else's child uh, and he was taking resources and time away from his actual kids now whether that's the way that joe felt or not i don't know i can't speak to that but i very much felt that that's the way that mateo felt joe felt uh, if that makes any sense. And so my entrance into the relationship between Joe and I and, and in the show itself was through that feeling, through being completely overlooked, through um, feeling like you, you just need to settle for what's given to you. And oftentimes we put on these, uh, these barriers on our dreams and on what we can do. And we end up settling for things that are far less than we're capable of. And, um, and so I saw Mateo is taking all of that as fuel to show other people that he can overcome those things and that he is better and possibly um, uh, even lovable. And that's, I feel like that's where Daniela comes in a really beautiful way where she shows Mateo that uh, he doesn't need to prove to anybody that he is um, lovable or 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 great. That she sees him now as that, rather than you know trying to get to that outcome and then finally turning around and getting that feeling. I don't know if that answered your question or if I just rambled, but uh, but yeah. I just got a message from Joe. He says, "I treat all my children the same." Joe would say that. Joe would say that. He would say that. Yeah, Joe like crap. <laughs> Just kidding. He treats them all the same, and one ended up going to New York forever and becoming a millionaire by selling his tequila brand. Listen, I, if only my parents did the same, I would be a millionaire by now. <laughs> no, no, but yeah, Gusto, uh, great answer, man. Great answer. Yes, uh, I love the whole immigrant struggle. I mean, it's it's something that a lot of us here resonate with. Um, but, you know, being the fact that this show takes place in two different, you know, time periods, I know that, you know, uh, with, with Katia and, and Rolando and, and, uh, you know, Bellamy, John, your characters, again, two different eras. How did you, um, how did you guys come together to play the same character in those two different eras? I think John spoke about this before in, his, in the answer to his last question, where it was, um, what did he say? He, uh, you know, people change. So for me, like playing Billy with the great uh, Yul Vasquez, uh, we're, I mean, we, I don't think you could be uh, further from, you know, like Billy's out here uh, taking names in the vineyard and then you see uh, Yul Vasquez as a priest. Um, so I think a lot of it really truly is like kind of leaning into the writing and just like kind of trusting that the character will evolve, you know, um, yeah and and those you know those subtle connections are still there i would definitely go to set and watch like little things you will did here and there like the way he got up or the way you know little ticks um 
but I think that was more like details than, you know, than the actual thing that like showed on screen because these characters, you know, evolve so much. Yeah, I I I like to think that the present storyline had it a little easier because we're 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 kind of with the present and then we go back in the flashbacks. That's kind of how it how it operates, I think. So, um, but uh, given that, um, I will say that Andres Velez, uh, who I spoke about earlier, who plays young Joe, um, really kind of brought it to my attention about the importance of us as actors playing the same character, getting together. And, you know, I politely try to just be like, you know, don't, don't worry about it too much, you know, just, <laughs> just, you know, you, uh, you haven't enough on your plate. Um, but to his credit, um, uh, you know, he pushed and really wanted to pick my brain and also, yeah, to pick my brain about how I came to some of the points that, uh, Joe is at, you know, uh, whether that's my voice or how I walk or as Joe and how I think and feel about certain people in the family. And, and, um, and, and at first I, like I said, I was a little resistant to, uh, toward it, but, but we ended up having like a two hour conversation, like two weeks before we started rehearsals and it was fascinating. Um, and he helped me out a lot because he cleared up some stuff that I kind of generally thought about and felt about uh, with the character. But uh, I wish he was here because he can speak about this more. But I will say that the stuff that we discussed, I thought, OK, this is, in, uh, this is an interesting conversation, but I don't know if it's ever going to make a difference. But let me tell you, it made a huge difference. I see it, and he plays it beautifully. It's subtle. It's nuanced. But you see um, the seeds, and it's a, it, it's on the written page. But he definitely brings a lot to it as well. He fills it up um, with these um, traces of old of present day Joe um, that you see, especially in some of the later episodes. Like you see it in the uh, labor stuff that's happening now in episode eight, and it's only going to become more and more um, uh, visible. I think to the viewers, but that's part of the fun of the show is seeing how, how does that character become that character in the present? Because they may be really different, or their similarities, but their uh, circumstances are so wildly different. But they're the same person, and to be able to, as a viewer, connect those dots and to see it and imagine what could have happened or what didn't happen. Um, is a lot of fun, I think, for uh, for the viewers as well. And I'm gonna follow up on that. I wish I'm over here, like, mm, oh, mm-hmm, uh oh, mm-hmm. like I was, I'm just a chorus over here. But I will add on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, I didn't get to meet Carrie until Carrie, who plays young Margaret, until like two weeks before shooting was done. Um, uh, and I know we had both asked to see, you know, some dailies of the other person. We, we share a line, like a very important line at one point. And I'm like, I can I see how she said it, you know, like, you know, all that sort of thing. And it never happened. And we'd hoped to do a dinner with the old and the new and, or the present in the past and, uh, and COVID, you know, it never happened. And so I really, want to give a huge shout out to Veronica Collins Rooney, who cast the shit out of the show. I mean, my coworkers, it was like going to school every day I went to work. I mean, again, led by our inimitable John Ortiz, but like every one astonishing. And that Veronica and Matt, that they found this dual, uh, this parallel universe of truth astonishes me. Um, and just one, just add one more thing to this uh, question. I, I think one of the 
biggest blessings that we could have had was being trapped together in a hotel room during the pilot not a hotel room a hotel during the, the pilot lows. Um, the, Hello. The, the lows um we i think we've we've told this story several times in different on different platforms but for some reason andres was given a massive suite and we all just ended up congregating there because like Bellamy mentioned, it was the middle of COVID and, and there wasn't really anywhere else for us to get together. Um, and just getting to be a, around each other, I, I think, I mean, I, I at least speak for myself, getting to just be around Ceci and, and get to talk, and like not only talk about character things, but just how, you know, how we each see life, how we each see the story, how we each, you know, relate to this character as, as women in different parts of our career and, and different moments in our in our life that was that was i think a huge help for me being able to bring this character to life and then you know from there when we finished the pilot we had no idea if we were going to get a full season or not or not but then when we did finally get picked up um having that as as kind of a, a base to to spring from uh was incredibly helpful and you know i John, you you mentioned being a little resistant towards towards Andres wanting to talk about these things, but I I I think that you and Ceci and and Yule did a really amazing thing for us and really gave us such a gift. Me and and Rolando and Andres giving us just your your support and your time and your attention. I I don't think any of us ever felt like we were like the new kids on the block getting to work with these heavy hitters. We were always just your your peers and, and your colleagues and, and getting to work with you guys on that same level. I, I don't know that we would have had the confidence to to work the way we did if it hadn't been for, for that guidance. Yeah, uh, second that and totally agreed. Like it was, I mean, we would congregate together and be like, oh my gosh, did you find out what you, or did you see what John said? Or did you see what Ceci, like it was, it, it was uh, you guys being open and available to even talk. And, and even if there was a little bit of a, like, uh, you know, politely declining or whatever, it was like the openness was there that we could keep asking, you know, in, in every regard. Uh, and, oh, and just one more thing to, for this question as well that I, I forgot, uh, just giving just more credit to the writers um, was, uh, there were little things in the script too that also helped with the connection between the characters. Like, um, just speaking for Billy, like every time there was alcohol there, like in the scene, just like making sure to like clock that and be like, oh, this is, what is my relationship here? Why am I doing this like here now? And all the times it was like, oh, there's something bad happening. Billy leans on something to, you know, on something else when, uh, when things are going down instead of expressing his feelings and, you know, so clues in the script also helped uh, a lot. I love this. I feel like we have all just taken a field trip into this show and have it. I don't know how else to, to say it other than, yeah, I'm going to stick with the field trip thing. So, okay, I'm going to reset the room real quickly here and uh, welcome everybody who has recently joined us. We are having a chat with the cast and creator of Promised Land, which is streaming on Hulu. And um, Rodrigo went ahead and I don't know why, whenever I'm in our rooms, I say Hulu as Hulu, like a Latina. And then when I'm speaking to other people, I say Hulu, right? It's crazy. But anyway, um, Rodrigo has, uh, has, has done us the favor of pinning a link to the series. So you can go ahead and go to Hulu and you know, stream the series. It's amazing, hint that you have to, if you haven't seen it, you have to absolutely watch this show. Uh, I am just waiting and waiting with bated breath for the next uh, episode to drop. Every episode has tremendous cliffhangers. It's just amazing. So with that, um, I want everybody to know in the audience, we're gonna go ahead and open up the Q&A to our audience members. And uh, we're going to have a quick reminder from Rodrigo about how we're going to go ahead and run that. So while Rodrigo does that, in us up on the stage, I'm going to go ahead and open audience participation so you can raise your hand. And we, one, we do ask that once you're done, we'll go ahead and uh, tuck you back into the audience. So Rodrigo, over to you. 
Thank you so much to everybody that's here right now. Again, quick, quick reset. This is Amigos, the largest Latinos, Latinas, you, you know, a group here, the Latinx group here on Clubhouse. Make sure you follow the little casita on the very top, the green mansion. Click on it, follow it, because we have rooms like this all the time. It's just like the, the show Promised Land. Our number one goal here is to elevate the community. Promised Land does it by showcasing actual issues that are happening to our comunidad, to nuestra gente, to everybody. What's really important, what's really happening out there, both from a historical perspective and also from a current perspective. We do the same thing here with the Amigos group, where we talk about topics that are relevant to everybody here, you know, and we talk about Latinidad, we talk about uh, immigration, we talk about blended families, parenting rooms, all kinds of stuff. So make sure if you're not already on, on the Amigos tip, get get there right now, catch that wave. We are the largest Latinx club here on Clubhouse. Now we are getting folks up on stage. Again, remind your folks, we wanna get as many questions as we can from as many folks as we can, because we do have the cast here, but we also wanna be respectful of their time. They're out here, uh, you know, hanging out with us and letting us share into their, you know, their perspectives and what made the show and, you know, uh, great scenes and so forth. So please, uh, as a favor to everybody, please limit your questions to one question and try to contain it within 60 seconds or so. We definitely do appreciate insightful questions, you know, something that maybe resonated with you or something that impacted you. So that's the type of questions that we're looking for. We are going to put folks back into the audience once your question has been asked. So no disrespect intended whatsoever when we do that. With that said, though, I will go ahead and kick it off to Santiago, who will go ahead and introduce the first person that's going to ask a question and take it from there. Santiago. Yeah, absolutely, man. And the first question up is from our good friend, Nando. Nando, um, go ahead, man. Ask your question. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Bellamy, I've been stalking you on Instagram, Twitter, so I just wanted you to put a voice to when you file the restraining order, okay? Um, <laughs> but Copy. My question is to Matt. One of the things that I love about the show is how authentic the language is when uh, the cast members are speaking Spanish. And so I wanted to know, so for example, in episode five, when um, Juana and Rosa are, are walking together and she says, Ay, hay mucho witty witty, más trabajo. I'm like, like my ears perked up because I'm like, does he have my gossiping aunt as consultant on the dialogue? Like, so my question is, how do you, how did you, how do you maintain the authenticity of when they're speaking that Spanish? I, I just have to, oh, sorry. Matt, you just took nope. your, your mic off. I don't know how to raise my hand on this thing. <laughs> no, no, I don't I don't know either. You want to take it, Katya? I think we're oh, I think we I was I just gonna say the answer is simple. The answer is Manuel answer. Witza, um, <laughs> who was our not only our dialect coach, but really our cultural mentor. Um when when the first question I asked my agents when they told me that I'd booked this job was are we having a dialect coach? Because if there's not gonna be a dialect coach, I'd I'm not doing this. And they were like, no, 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 don't worry. They're getting someone. And I I never thought that we would be so blessed um, to have this amazing, wonderful, generous human being um, helping guide us because that I think I speak for the for all of us in especially in our timeline where there's so much Spanish, where we we really needed this show and these characters to to be authentic and and um Manuel came on board since the pilot and was really just such a godsend. Um, he was so generous with his time, and and I have to thank Matt for for bringing Manuel on and for really pushing along, you know, with us to to keep Manuel throughout the whole series. Um, you, if you've watched episode five, you'll also get to see him in action. Um, he plays Manuel Rincon. Um, the boy's dad. Um, and he's Our just, papi. He, yeah, he's just fabulous. Wait, so wait, he was the dialect coach? He was. Wow, he he was awesome. the dialect coach. He's also an actor. So, yeah. oh um, so he um he got a little uh, he got to play with us too, both on screen and behind the scenes. But um he, for for most of the series, um he was our, our dialect coach. Um and, yeah. and he helped translate the scripts with us and everything. Yeah, I'll I'll just chime in super briefly because that's a that's a terrific response. Manuel Urisa his contributions, I call him my partner in crime, his contributions to the show are in many ways immeasurable um, because it, it really, we ended up, I think he's credited as creative consultant, uh, 
which I had to get like cleared by the guild and everything because like dialect coach does not come close to capturing what he brought um, on authenticity. You know, we spoke about sort of the diaspora, right? Um, and, 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 and that applied to the Spanish spoken, right? I've got sort of my bad Cuban Spanish and Manuel, you know, I did the, the first translation of the pilot was mine. And Manuel, in his in a very sweet manner, was like, you know, a Mexican person would never say it this way. We would say this, you know, specific words or just it, it turns a phrase that I had never heard um, before. Um, even words that we call, you know, um, like in 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 where I grew up is papi. You know, everything's papi. Um, and, and apa was a new kind of word for me. And like, we didn't, I never used it. I never grew up hearing it. So all, all these little things he brought, he's also a brilliant actor in his own right. Um, and, and, and our Spanish needed it. Uh, there were a couple of times Cristina Ochoa, you know, <laughs> would give a zeta and it was like, you know, Manuel would very nicely go over to her and, <laughs> and say, no, no, no. Um, so yeah, uh, it was, it was very important. It, I knew to have a show with this much Spanish on American TV, it's extremely, extremely rare. And so authenticity being as authentic as possible was very important. You know, and I think that was very relevant um, because my wife and I, we, you know, we would binge it on the show and we're both New Yorkers, obviously. So, like, when I hear um, John, you know, and he's a Puerto Rican from Brooklyn and I don't hear, a, you know, a, anything of a Puerto Rican from Brooklyn in, in the show. So, great job to him and awesome performance. I love this, I love him in the show. Well, thank you. I, I uh, Whenever I had Spanish, I would call manuel in in a panic and be like brother please record this for me <laughs> uh and he and he also helped out the present day um folks as well but to speak to that authenticity like specifically within the culture and the region of mexico where um our characters are from um was priceless you know I just wanted to add before we go to Dali for the next question, John. When you when you talk to uh, Father Ramos and you said, "Orale, tú y yo, vámonos," I felt that, bro. I totally <laughs> felt that. That was so Mexican. And it was like I felt like I was in San Antonio and I had just disrespected my tío's carne guisada. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it was spot on, spot on, John. Oh, great. Rodrigo and I, Rodrigo and I, are gonna reenact that next Saturday when we meet up in in the door. I, uh, I will be. <laughs> Please, uh, please film it and video it and uh, send it over. I would love to see it. You got it. Yeah, it's going to be great. The three of us have zero talent, but we'll work on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, we would like to go ahead and send the microphone over to Dali. Dali, what's your question? Oh, I have so many, but you said I can only ask one. And I just want to thank everybody, uh, the cast, for being here. So my question is actually for Bellamy, because you tend to play some really intense roles. So what draws you to play these complex characters? And is there any type of role that you would not be willing to play for any reason? Ah, oh, dog. Yeah. Well, gosh, it seems like my dog would like to answer for me. Um, Dolly, thank you for that question. And um, I guess I just feel very, very lucky because, uh, you know, so often the female in the narrative is the, the girlfriend or the mother, you know, like that's a very narrow path to tread. And I've been really, really blessed in my career to, again, get to just be really messy, ambitious and flawed and have a lot of big feelings and um, atone and mess up again and uh, just keep fumbling forward, which I think is the human experience. So I think it doesn't have to be gendered in any way. We can all tell our stories with our big hearts, no matter what they're wrapped in. Um, was there anything I wouldn't do? You know, uh, I, I feel lucky. I'm, I've spent, I'm 52. I've spent all these years just being grateful to have a job. So um, it hasn't been, you know, I haven't been as careful as some people are able to be, you know, because I, um, 
I'm just not in that position. But I do feel finally um, to be at a point where there are very clear lines. It's also a different time in the world. There's um, uh, all of us I uh, are a little more uh, awake, hopefully, and continuing on that path. So I think um, I would easily say there are a lot of things that I wouldn't do now. I think a lot about what I'm putting into the world and what I want to be a part of. John spoke so eloquently about what a family this has been. So uh, well, these days, you know, we're so lucky to get to do what we love for a living. Um, and it's so weird to me uh, if someone's in that space and they're, you know, miserable. <laughs> so it's, you really want to take the tenor of the family you're walking into as well, if you can. I know um, that comes from Shonda Land days. Shonda has a big no assholes policy, like very public, not a secret, like, like life's too short and our days are too long. So, um, but more, uh, it's more about Here's the thing. I feel like we're finally having real conversations in my lifetime, and uh, I want to be a part of the real conversations. I don't want to be a part of the pat sort of formulaic horizontal motion. I want to be a part of something that moves something forward with love and inclusion. And so I don't want to, I don't want to I don't want to spend a lot of time running from an axe murderer in the woods. I don't want to. Um, spend a lot of time uh just read a script that's you know done by fancy people and doing fancy things but all the women hate each other and that doesn't seem like a thing i want to be a part of um, so it's just um like choices with my heart uh i, I i'm probably being a little bit in co about this but um I, I hope that i'm making a little bit of sense i feel lucky about where we are in the world and particularly in the world of entertainment because I think the stories we tell do just just they take one step before the rest of culture you know we often can lead the conversation lead the way lay the path let people feel things that they can't it's too dangerous to feel in their real lives you know like help people through and i just want to be a part of helping people through so i'm starting like as i'm starting to develop also p.s dolly the people on this call that are half my age have done more like development in their lifetime than i have i'm just coming to that um so they should answer too but uh as i start to develop things that's really what i'm looking for i want to be a part of the conversations like this conversation come on this time we spent together so beautiful so i hope that's somehow helpful okay bellamy yes yeah. <laughs> i love that bellamy with the energy yo. come on bellamy amen yes. amen oh my god i wish you could hear the color red that's what my cheeks sound like and i'm so stoked that you actually said my name thank you so much <laughs> Yeah, Thank we you. can see Dolly's cheeks yeah, are Dolly's red right now. Cheeks are too. <laughs> yeah, Dolly's like really happy. She didn't have She's to definitely fangirling right now, Bella. Thank you for that. It's mutual. Yeah, so with that being said, Miss Susie, you're up next. What question do you have? Hey, I am just like blown away by this conversation. Um, my question has to do, uh, I'm gonna share one moment of my past. I'm sorry, my cat's meowing. It's probably talking to your cat and your dog, Bellamy, but, um, so I am first gen Mexican American, first in my family to go to college. We came, you know, we were very poor, et cetera. And there was a lot of trauma, but I didn't know about the trauma really until this past year. Like you just don't really know that there is trauma and I'm Bellamy's age. And so one of the things that has been striking me about this show is all the unspoken and unrecognized trauma that is happening. And I think you guys are acting it beautifully, but I wonder to just ask the whole cast and Matt, if you have thought about that aspect of your characters and of the way things are evolving, like why, like so many of the things that happen, the way you respond to things are trauma responses that haven't been really examined. And my name's Susie and I'm done speaking.
Um, okay, I, I, I'll I'll start the ball. Um, my character, like the 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 when Matt and I uh, first had our conversations about the character, that was something that I brought up immediately. Where it was like, if we have the opportunity to look at a villain, uh, a queer villain, then looking at the trauma that happens to them, um, and that was a predominantly like the motivating force for a lot of the actions that Antonio had. Um, Matt and the rest of the writers, Chris Pena, in this particular instance, in episode 106, um, Javier and Antonio share some intimacy. And it's the first time, like it took almost fighting each other, like almost getting into a physical fight for him to drop any of his walls. And just being at, or just hearing about the future that could have been for him triggered him immediately enough to get out of there. Um, and it's just fascinating because there's something, there's a necessity in Latinidad or in Latin families. Like, familia is first, right? Family is everything. And we need each other, but we're also the oppressors of each other at the same time. There isn't, like, shared language to help us heal. We mm, Therapy and stuff like that is something para los locos, o para gringos, peor. <clears throat> And so I think the way, the, the way that this show is written, it, it, we like, I, don't, I think it was Dr. Brene Brown or Dr. Estelle Perel who said, relational trauma can only be healed through relationships. And I think that Matt keeps putting us, our characters in situations where we serve as each other's mirror. Because I think that's the only way that we're allowed to heal. Yes, yes. I would say I think um, I think trauma. You you hit on something, Susie. It it trauma is an undercurrent throughout the series, and especially you know for the characters for the first gen characters, and we can see by holding a mirror up. We can see, you know, because we also get the benefit of seeing their younger versions of themselves. And we can see those layers of trauma. And, and it's, it, like I said, it's an undercurrent. It's not something, it's, it's not like trauma TV per se. Um, I think it's very telling. It's something I've recognized in my parents. Like it's, it's very telling that you feel like you're just kind of finding out about this now or coming, you know, you reach an age where it's, I'm the same age and you reach an age where it's like, uh, I don't know, you, you just, you, you appreciate that in a different way. I remember a conversation I had with Yul um, Vasquez who, who plays, uh, Father Ramos slash older version of Billy. Um, before this was before we were even cast, and he and I know a lot of the same people. Um, and, and but I'd never worked with him and never met him before, and it was our very first conversation. And he told me about something that um, happened to him when he was a little boy, uh, walking down um, the street with his mother. He's a Cuban kid, came here. Uh, as, as a boy and he was talking to his mother in Spanish on the streets of Miami and this couple was coming the other way and he said the guy just very casually just looked at him he was probably six years old and said Sp speak fucking English and you said and I think this is an interesting insight about the show and about the immigrant experience and about all the characters maybe even especially joe is like there's something extremely he, he said you know i wish i could say that there's been a week of my life that's gone by that i hadn't thought of that he's like but i i always think about it it's like always with me and what's interesting about it is like on the one hand it is deeply traumatic you know that that here's this guy that and you, the way you'll put it was no matter how much success I have, and he's been this very successful actor for 30 years, you know, um, that, that's still there. He, that strikes a nerve. He feels that vulnerability. At the same time, he said, even as a boy, I remember 
like as soon as I heard it, I felt this deep shame, but I also felt this incredible sense of like a grievement, but in grievement, like imp- it, like channeling to empowerment. Like he said, like I could almost as deeply as it wounded me, almost in the very next instance, I he was like, I am going to show them. And I think that's something that the Sandoval's experience, you know, and Joe's character in particular, it's like, um, there's different things that we can do with trauma. And I think it's kind of interesting to see characters, we don't respond to trauma in the same way. Some of us deeply internalize it, some of us externalize it. And I don't know, I'm just fascinated by, by seeing how the different characters in the show uh, do that. No, that's 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 great. That's a great um, answer, Matt. And uh, because you spoke about how it affects Joe, um, I had a similar um, incident when I was like fourteen, and I was going to a friend's house to play wiffle ball in Brooklyn, and it was the Italian neighborhood, and uh, um, and this kid who was no more than five years old blocked my path and with turned into a beast in a voice and said just said spick and it was the first time that someone said that to me and i was like shocked and hurt and embarrassed and angry furious and ashamed like so many things and like you'll you know there hasn't been a day that i haven't thought about that and that's you know what joe faced and i and i and i and i pocketed that memory um as an actor when i when i've been playing joe you know in terms of you know he externalized it in that I'm going to show them, but there's also that element of like, not only am I going to show them that I can be better, that I can like be better than them, but how, 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 how am I going to show them? How am I going to behave in a way that is affected by that in a not so positive way, even though you think it's, it's, it's doing you a service in in it, on one level but on another level and this is the stuff that i was talking about with assimilation and that speech and that thing of like laughing at their jokes you know that are aimed at you you know um what do you sacrifice because you don't want to confront that you know you wish you could but you you know you like when is it that you do cower to it you know and when is it that you do say, you know, enough is enough, um, and uh, that's wrong, and uh, and that so there was that thing, Matt. Thanks for bringing that up because that was very strong, not only to me personally but to the character. And very quickly, I'll say the trauma of. of The, the father character and coming from a broken home, you know, coming from a home that a uh, relationship with a father that's not healthy and that's incredibly dysfunctional and 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 how does that reflect um, your your um, position when you become a father? And it's and there's a scene that I have with you actually where I say, you know, I thought I was going to be different than him but turns out on one level i'm pretty much the same you know um so anyway uh that to me is um is very interesting when it comes to the trauma question that wow was those cool. were uh, sorry i just want to add one more thing because i was that was super inspiring throwing on matt and john that was that's wild uh thank you for sharing and being open um and just really quickly to share uh just my, I think, thank you for the question again, Susie, I believe you asked it. Uh, I, something with Billy, um, just speaking of, yeah, of the trauma and stuff that I, I 
I just was super inspired after hearing all your, your stuff was, uh, how, you know, as an immigrant and, uh, like seeing my parents, like, you know, having to get their GED and like, you know, go to college, like at an older age, like I, I'm also the oldest of four siblings. Um, and for a really long time, I had to like help take care of my siblings, like, because my parents, and you know, my parents are great and they tried so hard, but they also had to like work and go to school and, uh, and all I had to do, you know, when I'm 10 years older than two of my younger siblings and I had to like take care of them for a really long time. And it, uh, and you know, I think as the oldest, sometimes you kind of have this thing where, uh, no, I don't have any trauma. You know, I, I'm fine. I'm the oldest. I can take it. I can take it as, you know, my, in my back and, and, you know, I, I think it's really beautifully written that, uh, you know, older Billy, like has to go through all this stuff and then find God, you know, to really unpack all of the things that, that happened. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I think, uh, and for me, like moving out was such a big deal. Cause and then, and for me, it happened after my siblings went to college, like even like whether or not that was subconsciously or not, it was like, oh, they grew up. I can also live my life. Now I don't have to t worry about them. They're going to be fine. Um, and I still love them and everything, but, uh, yeah, the burden we have to bear as immigrants is real, you know? Wow. Um, that's all I've got. I, I will say, uh, John, I heard that in your speech. I absolutely, absolutely heard it in your speech. So, uh, lo tenía guardado and man, you brought it out. Um, Santi, do you want to introduce the next person? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, up next, we have Jerry Weil, who, um, he's an actor SAG from LA. Um, Jerry, what's your question for the, for the crew? Wow. You, you've pronounced my last name correctly. So congrats on that. Nobody usually does. I've been on um, fire. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really have a question, but it's just great to see everybody here. I've been working on the post side of the show and literally been staring at your faces for months. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's, I, I love the show and it's just great to uh, see everybody here and hear everybody's stories. So uh, thanks, thanks for making a great show and thanks for, it's been really fun to work on. So uh, thanks for giving me fun work to do as well. I'm Jerry and I'm done. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Wait, uh, thank you, Jerry. Jerry, what did you do? Tell us more. And thank you. Um, I, I do all the 3D visual effects. And um, I don't know if I can say exactly what I've been doing because <laughs> that's up to Matt. So I don't know what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. Amazing. Jerry, do you work for Crafty? Yes, I do. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. You guys have done a tremendous job. The, a little, a little, an unknown challenge of this show is that uh, we have an additional wrinkle that other shows don't have to deal with is that uh, vineyards have a season. And uh, it just so happens that when we got greenlit to go to series, uh, the vines in all the vineyards in which we shoot, and in every vineyard in North America for that matter, or in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, was only about two weeks away from losing all of its leaves. Uh, and so uh, Jerry and the super talented people that he works with uh, did a magnificent job of like sort of this Rubik's cube of solutions that we have to make those vineyards look as beautiful that, as they do. So so thank you so much, Jerry. We Woo! really appreciate you. Absolutely. Those shots were actually the most fun that I've had uh, on the show, so. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for giving me the work to do. Jerry, you know, my wife will surely uh, appreciate that because every time, you know, they cut back from a commercial and they show the the scene there of the vineyard, she goes, man, you better be taking me there somewhere. So thank you, Jerry, for uh, giving her inspiration for our next vacation. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. So up next, uh, we've, we've got Trent, who's been very, very active in the chat. She is a mega fan. So Trent, I'll let you to have the have the floor and ask your question. Hi guys. Hi, Bellamy. Um, you guys are amazing. First of all, you guys do an absolutely amazing job, but okay. So my question is 
you guys have a lot of emotional scenes. So anybody can answer this. What has been the most emotional scene like you've had to like take a breather a couple times during the show? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start because <laughs> it seemed like after episode four, I was like emotional scene after emotional scene uh, for Joe. Um, and uh, just when I thought, you know, OK, I can't go any further or Joe can't go any further because that was pretty intense and emotional. Well, uh, Matt pushed it and we went further and further. Um, and uh, and so it was a great challenge, actually, to to be able to uh, differentiate um, the emotional scenes that are that seemingly are kind of the same, but they're not because they're not doing the characters aren't doing the same thing, you know, like so. So to really dig in there and and figure out, well, what is it that the character is doing that is so happens that these emotions are coming up and 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 being really specific about that um so that was incredibly helpful on something that i thought was like oh man i wasn't like really looking forward to going there emotionally it was like actually kind of kind of a nice challenge and fun to, to 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 figure it out in a real way right in an honest way and so um but i will say specifically I, and I can't have any spoilers, and but this is a lot of fun because the episodes aren't out yet. But in nine and ten, if you think Joe has been emotional between four and seven or four and eight, then you got something coming. Man, why would you do that to us? Ooh. <laughs> hi, Dio Mio. Awesome. And Tran, you know, I got to say hi to you. Say hey, and I love you. I saw your picture. I'm glad you're here with us tonight. Uh, and I'm just going to say the, the, that the, uh, watching John, listen, the great thing about this family of people too is that it's not, you're not just there on your work day. Usually like people show up to watch other people's work and they're like, there have been a couple of John moments <laughs> that there have been more people like, behind video village and there have been on set and we've had like 50 extras do you know i mean it's just like people come to watch the magic happen and he's been given like this you know these speeches that just the the nation the world feels and need to be heard and it's been beautiful to watch uh and instructive and i will say on that note to answer your question for me this season i had a scene with christina um where I'm just, she's like so, she's so coming at me with no, and I'm just trying to give her the name of a lawyer, and uh, so she won't make the mistake I've made. And the scene like broke my heart enough anyway. There's so much, um, so much shame, so much regret, uh, and so much frustration. You know, when you just can't, you're trying to do the right thing, you can't get through to somebody. But um, talk about talent, like Christina we did a master and then we did her coverage first and she punched me in the face with so much life and truth and heartbreak uh that it was well i mean it did so much of my work for me but it was also humbling and elevating and just so memorable like that day on set is such a gift so thanks for asking that question mama Um, yeah, just to jump in here, um, well, for just to jumpstart the entire show, um, I, you know, for those of you who have, who have watched the show and seen the pilot, the very first scene that we shot of the entire show was when Rosa gets left at the hospital by, um, Juana and Carlos. And so to jump into this entirely new experience, um, with you know these two co-stars who I'd pretty much just met, um, and just jump into this insanely emotional and, and devastating scene was terrifying, um, to be completely honest. And I, I think the only way that it it worked um, was that you know uh, Ariana who plays Rosa and Andres who plays Carlos, the the three of us were just 
very much there present together um and i i trusted them from the get-go and and that's kind of been the i think the through line for any emotional scene um thereafter i've i've been blessed with getting to work with co-stars who i just trust so so much um and you know i've i've been challenged by the material and by the writing so much uh thank you matt um and you know especially in in episodes seven eight and you guys haven't seen nine and ten yet but i think that's been some of the most challenging work i've ever had to do as an actress and knowing that um you know the the people who i'm sharing these scenes with rolando ariana andres all of them are are there for me and with me and and like Bellamy said, this whole cast like we we go to to watch each other's work and to support each other and to feel that you know the the emotions are are so delicate and so raw, but to know that like I if I fall, I have you know a cast of of I don't even know how many we are at least twelve people who are there to catch me. Um, and to get to, you know, like Bellamy described working with Christina, you know, when even when the camera isn't on me and we're doing, you know, not my coverage, knowing that, OK, we're we're present together. We are just feeding off each other and giving each other. And even if the scenes are are, you know, um, even if they're they're difficult or angry or, um, you know, hurtful there's still this this underlying tone of of love both on the character side and on the you know us actor side um so i think that was really just a huge a huge plus in in being able to get through it yeah i uh, i i second what everyone said and i'm also super super hyper excited for Odyssey episode 10 because i think that's my my pick as well um all the episodes are uh yeah they all elevate and then 10 is just i think that my favorite challenging scene was um what happened in eight with julio um i guess it's the most recent one so i don't want to spoil it just in case somebody hasn't seen it but the ending of that um and making the choice to stand with the family um, and wrestling with that darkness was just such a gift. It was so much fun to play. <laughs> wow. Um, this is why we, even though we have literally probably a hundred questions for you guys, we like to open it up to the audience because the audience always brings fire with questions. And that was a perfect example. Um, so Trin, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, send the mic over to Rodrigo who will introduce the next question. Yeah, and uh, Lupita who is here is, is here with us. She's actually traveling on the road so the ambient noise uh, might be a little too much, but she asked me to ask this question and it's it's uh, directed towards Matt. Uh, she says, I was so pleasantly surprised on how the immigrant journey and what immig immigrants go through as they cross the border was portrayed. As I turned tuned into Bellamy's IG Live and listened to her what she said that you, Matt, were really pushing to share this part of the immigrant story, it, it made me wonder, why was it that important for you to push to tell that part of the immigrant story? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think in the whole, what passes for an immigration debate or discussion in this country is uh, pretty, pretty embarrassing and pretty weak, um, to put it mildly. I think what I sought to do always is, you know, I, I think it would have been easy for the show to stand on a soapbox. Uh, and I was determined not to do that. I was determined to um, just portray the immigrant characters with as much humanity and compassion and nuance as we possibly could um and then 
that would speak for itself. Um, and then viewers, no matter what their background, would inevitably find glimmers of their own lives and their own families there. Um, you know, it, it was important for me, strangely, or maybe ironically is the right word, in that I'm a, my family's immigrant experience is, is a little more removed. Um, I'm third generation American. And so I grew up in a Spanish speaking household, like where my parents spoke a lot of Spanish to each other, but to us, it was English. Like I'm, a, they were of this generation, like we want the, these kids need to be American, you know? And, um, and so for large portions of my life, I, I, I didn't feel particularly um, associated with the immigrant experience because it was, like I said, a little more in the review mirror than certainly some of our cast members who are either immigrants themselves or first generation. And um, I had a moment, you know, um, in, the, in the formulating stages of this idea where I had been approached by uh, the studio and, and they asked me to sort of, you know, give thought to you know, they wanted to tackle a Latino drama. That's really all they had. And they, you know, I was fortunate enough. They gave me license to do anything I wanted. And and so I was kind of knocking it around. And, and of all places at, at a Home Depot one day, I went to pick up something at a Home Depot. And um, there were some day laborers out in the parking lot, you know, waiting for, you um, waiting for someone, you know, a foreman to come by in a pickup truck and, and give them a job so they could feed their families with a day's wage. And I had like what I've referred to as a moment of clarity where on the one hand, because I've been, I grew up enjoying so many of the benefits and opportunities of this country, um, my life seems so on, on, on the surface level, on the level that means not so much. It, my life seems so different than those uh, men, and they were predominantly men that day. Um, but the moment of clarity I had was on, that on a deeper, more fundamental level, um, the only real difference between me and them was the passage of time. And that's where the idea came from. Like, what if we told the immigrant an immigrant journey at two different points along the timeline because my grandparents and their parents, you know, came, they didn't speak a lick of English. They, they worked in factories, they worked in fields. And, and so I felt all of a sudden this tremendous responsibility and not, not so much responsibility, that was part of it, but really a passion to, to tell that immigrant story, um, you know, with as much, honesty and truth as we possibly could. Um, and I have to say, it's, it's not like anything I've ever tackled. If you were here at the beginning, you've heard like my credits, like I, you know, and, 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 uh, but it was by far like the most important story I've told and the most, um, just judging by the, the way it's resonated with not only this amazing cast you hear, but just viewers who have seen the show who reach out to me and have been like this is my family thank you thank you you've brought back so many memories like this is my parents picked you know strawberries in santa paula i've never seen their story before you know thank you and uh it's just it's very it's very gratifying thank you so much for that answer matt and yes um you know, a lot of us relate to the show and I'm sure that you guys get DMs all the time saying, oh my God, this hit the nail right on the head. I know I sent John after I saw the first episode, I, I sent him that crazy, uh, I, I sent him a text message after seeing that crazy plot twist, que, you know, Los Hermanos and all that stuff. So I'm like, oh my God, dude, you're hitting a lot of points here right on the head. So, uh, you know, up next, we have Nanda, who's been very, very active in the, in the chats there. So Nanda, go ahead. The floor is yours. Ask your question. Hey, oh my God, this is so exciting. Um, I love this show so much. So first I want to thank Matt for creating the show. That's so amazing in so many ways, like so many wonderful storylines happening. 
Um, and the cast, oh, oh my God, I was going to swear here, sorry. Um, the cast is so talented and so gorgeous. So it's like, it's a wonderful show to watch, like all around. Um, my question is, um, who came up with the idea of Drunk Letty? Because I mean, that's probably like the most iconic moment of the show so far for me. Yes, drunk Letty. Oh my God! Yeah. You know, drunk Letty, and like how much of that drunk was, was like um, scripted, and how much was just Sessie doing her thing and improving, and yeah, what what it was like for the cast too to be there for like if they were there to shoot it. Too. I think my wife asked me to re yeah, to, to rewind that part like five or six times because like Arake Puse was hilarious. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Yeah, it was iconic, iconic. Uh, so Letty always in the script, she always got drunk in that scene. Um, she's been obviously going through a lot and um, she's, um, you know, Ramos has left town. She's torn with these feelings for Ramos. She's got a husband who seems increasingly alienated from the people that they were and the ideals that they had when they arrived. Um, and so to the, to the extent that the man who once led a strike against the owner of a vineyard is now the owner of a vineyard and prepared to like basically lock out his own workers. So that was always there. Um, the, the drunk Letty that I, the response to drunk Letty is just so it's so awesome. It's just like, it, it's like it blew up Twitter. Um, it, it, um, you know, so, so some of it was scripted, um, but I, I mean, some of it is just pure Cecilia. Um, Cecilia was very excited to play it from the moment she read it. She was, she came up to me and she was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, cause she had not, you know, Letty is a character who keeps a lot bottled up. Um, and Cecilia just let it rip. And what you saw, which I'm so glad is Cecilia is such as the, the actors can attest. She is such an outsized personality. We all, we, I just, we adore her. I, I think, and, and she, um, to see that comedic timing, you know, um, and those comedic instincts, um, but at the same time, there's a pathos to it. Like she's laughing and, but at the same time, she's kind of telling her kid junior, like when he's like, oh, it's like getting back in touch with our roots. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like you were born in a mansion. I was, you know, born in a, in, in a, in a bathtub, like, like, um, so it, it, what she did that, you know, I just, I, I give her all the credit in the world for was make it a scene that is at once highly entertaining. Um, but at the same time, we spoke about trauma before, like she's laughing and she's drunk, but she's, you know, there's the past is right there on her shoulder, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a great scene. I'm, I'm so glad people have responded to it. And I so hope that we will one day from Matt get a super cut of all the improvised um, exit lines. Because Cesar! I, Cesar! Cesar! Like, I, it's just, oh, it was too delicious. Yeah, every, every, every take was different. And it just wasn't the improv lines. Like, even the lines that she said word for word um, in multiple takes they all came out different as a good drunk person would do um and sassy yeah she had a blast like i she wasn't drunk for real but i tell you it was like being with a drunk person like when she was t giving me those lines i didn't know what to expect and she was having a blast and she would come to me in between takes and be like oh john this is so much fun Oh, I'm having so much fun. I'm like, oh, really? I can't tell. And she's like, no, no, no. I'm having so much. You know, with comedy, you can do, as long as it's connected to the truth, John Ortiz, you can do anything. And boy, did she. 
<laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, Cecilia, man, she's she's such a great talent. She does an amazing job there in the show. And, um, you know, up next, I, I, I deny, is there anything else you want to meet uh, or do you want to bring up before um, we bring up the last question from Miss Christina? Uh, no, not at all. Let's go all ahead right. and send the mic over to her. Cool. Christina, the mic is yours. I, we saved the best for last. So uh, here's the, the Promised Land super fan of Amigos, aside me, of course. Uh, Christina, go ahead. Thank you, Santiago. Hey, everyone. Um, my question is for um, the entire cast. I know you guys can't say too much, but can you describe the finale in one or two words? Bum, bum, bum. Epic. Wow. Devastating. New beginnings. Profound. Heartbreaking. I'm going to say devastating again. I'll say also uh, three words. Who is it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> not that, Bellamy. Not that. Leave it. No. Leave, leave it to La Honeycroft to leave us this Mexican way. Mexican gasp. <laughs> Gasps in Mexican. Gasping in novella. <laughs> the cliffhangers of all cliffhangers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the answer. Denai, go ahead, take it away. Thank you for that. Oh, this has been an amazing, amazing uh, time. I want to thank everybody here. Uh, John, Rolando, Bellamy, Matt, Katia, Augusto, Tonatiu. Um, Thank you all for joining us and for spending, you know, two hours. Oh, holy cow. I didn't realize it was two hours already. Um, for spending with us and just letting us delve into these characters, into the story. Uh, you know, if you have not seen this show, Hente, and I've been getting so many back channels from people telling me, oh my gosh, I have to watch this now. Yes, yes, duh, you have to watch this show. And we're all so excited about it. Uh, it is an absolute, absolutely wonderful show. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for jumping in here and letting us get to know you, getting to know the characters, um, you know, what drives uh, the way you interpret each of these characters and, uh, and just letting us uh, really get to know more about you. I want to thank you all. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the room. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, give space to our guests um, to just say some last words and, you know, let us know something that, Maybe we should have asked you a question about or something that you love about the character or whatever it is that you want to let us know. Um, you know, just go ahead and uh, let us know that. And we can start with John. Over to you. Well, I just got to say a huge thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to, like, be able to share something that I may feel when I do a project. But... I can't quite, there's not that space or that connection with other people and to like receive it from you guys and the support that you've shown so far on the show, but then to have the uh, the, the, the uh, ability to just extend that invitation to the cast and know and deeply that I'm not alone in feeling the amount of gratitude and love that I have for this story and the way that we're going about and telling it and how it's resonating with a lot of people so far, but hopefully a lot more. So thank you for giving us this space. Thank you for the support. And please, if you like the show, tell everybody because there's so much more to tell with these characters. And we really hope that we can, uh, we can have that opportunity with the season two. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Um, thank you so much. This is, um, it's, it's really gratifying to, to see how, uh, the chord that the show has struck with people and uh, people who see the show, uh, you know, love the show. And now it's just a question of getting as many eyeballs <laughs> as possible in front of the show. So then I, Rodrigo, Santiago, um, and everybody over there on your team, thank you. Thank you so much for giving this this platform. You got a little glimpse, I think, into 
the thoughtfulness, the level of craft, the level of passion and artistry that this cast has brought to this uh, has brought to this show. You know, um, the the they they really are a familia, um, and uh, and and it was maybe my favorite thing that's that or the most gratifying thing that's been said on in this entire wonderful experience was like that as viewers of the show you can see that come through because there would be moments where i'm like oh my god like i've never been part of a project or a cast that bonded like this that and I, and and it's perfect because they're playing a family and you wonder i'm like gosh i hope this comes through you know and to to see now that it does is uh, is really great so thanks for thanks so much for for taking the time I will echo what these gentlemen who lead us have so eloquently said, and I will also add, uh, we thank you, Maddie, because you've created something worthy of discussion. You've created something that has lit up the conversation, but also the hearts, the passions, and the hopes of so many of us. And so it's a, always a joy to play, but tonight has been a real joy to dissect, deconstruct, and really come together on these issues and these themes, these thoughts, these big, big feelings. So thanks, amigos, for making the space. And thanks, everybody, for sharing tonight with us. And much, much love to each of you. Be safe. Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to say to mi gente, um, it's been such an honor to like be here with y'all and to hear your voices and your stories. Um, a lot of us have our own immigration story and I know that um, the last few years um, our people have been villainized and um, talked to under a certain light and so you're not alone um, and it's just an honor to be able to hold this truth of ours uh, and to witness it or to share that with you guys. So. Thank you so much. And we literally wouldn't be anywhere without you. So here's a shout out to all of you. Yeah, thank you so much, y'all. Uh, appreciate um, René Rodrigo Santiago um, and John for inviting us you know, out here to, to speak. Matt, thank you again for the story. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Mucho love and your questions were awesome. And uh, thank you for staying with us and please stick around uh, to see the rest of the show. Uh, mad love. Um, I wanted to take a second to just thank Matt, going back to the thing about family. Um, not only did Matt give us an opportunity to have these kind of conversations on a scale that ha hasn't been had, I don't think, before on uh, network and the bravery in which he went about doing that, but also um, for gifting us all a kind of family. Uh, and I'm so appreciative of all of the relationships that I've made through this, especially the one with you, Matt. Um, and thank you everyone for, uh, not only recognizing that, but also being part of that family and that conversation. Thank you so much. I go, so I know on the show that they, they say you're the sour one, but that was very sweet of what you just said. Yeah, you're definitely not the sour one, Augusto. Sweet and sour over it's here. It's from the show. <laughs> and you know, one thing I want, before we depart, guys, and before we close out the room, I just want to add uh, to the people down there to, down there that joined us for the past two hours, thank you so much for coming through. Please show the same love to uh, this wonderful, wonderful show. It's on Hulu st streaming. Catch up. Go binge watch. It is a great show to watch. Um, and yeah, there's not a lot of representation for our, for our gente, for nuestra comunidad. So we're always complaining that, dude, why don't why don't I see myself on TV? Why don't we have that reflection? De nuestro color, lo, lo color de nuestra cultura. Please, uh, this show has all of that, you know, and it shows one thing about the Latinx community. We're not all one color, one, you know, uh, hairstyle. We're just a, a blend of everything. And this show has that. So uh, please come through, show some love, Check out the show. We need that season two because after the way they just ended it with one word described that last episode, we got to have that second season. So come through. Please show love. Check it out. Mr. Nye, go ahead. 
Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and send the mic real quickly over to Rodrigo because I know he had a few words he wanted to say, and then we'll clo we'll close out the room. Rodrigo, over to you. Yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody for be coming out here. You know, these are the type of shows that we're always talking about that we want to see on TV, and now we have one, uh, a show that I know for me spoke to me on so many profound levels. Uh, when when uh, Katia and Rolando's uh, characters cross and their their joy there, they spoke on it earlier. My mom and I, when we watched it, she spoke about that joy of crossing over. Even though my dad and her were broke as hell, they had a ham and cheese sandwich crossing through El Paso, and she remembers the joy of just putting her feet here in the United States. You know, uh, moments like those, uh, 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 Tonatio, your, your character, I watched the show with my son, and, and uh, you said something in an interview that you had with The Advocate where you said being gay, being queer is not homogenous. That's not one way of doing, there's not one way of doing it. And I absolutely loved it because I think this show represents that as well. You know, there, it's not just one Latin vision or version of Latinidad. There's so many different ones and this show captures all that and it explores so many things that are going on right now. The conversations that we have here on Clubhouse regarding homophobia, regarding uh, patriarchy, regarding, uh, uh, you know, white supremacy, uh, uh, white mediocrity, and, and, and all kinds of things on all so many different levels. And so I just wanted to give you all my appreciation and really implore everybody that's in the audience, that's in the mezzanine, please go out there and go to your Hulu and watch this show, send it to your friends, subscribe to it, or press like, go to everybody's profile, go to their social media, follow them on Instagram, on Twitter, because as you can see, there's so much passion and heart in this project that more than likely the folks that are here on stage are also doing other projects that involve their heart and, and their passion. So uh, please, I, I, again, please follow the show, go there, uh, follow the folks that are on here. And again, thanks to everybody that's here on stage because y'all have been part of a special show that really speaks to so many out there. And at least for me, it really spoke to my heart. And I thank each and every one of y'all for that. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Yes, uh, again, I'm follow that up with thank you all. You know, Matt, like you, I'm a Cuban American. So my story isn't that of, um, you know, the Mexican American story, but I resonate so much with the show because I am an immigrant. My dad was a political prisoner. And, you know, many of the struggles that the immigrant community faces are, are struggles that you talk about in the show that you that you touch upon in the show and so you know for me it's it's a beautiful beautiful representation of that of the latino story um i know that you know it, there was a, a dialogue in in one of the episodes i think it was episode two or three and it was one of my favorite favorite parts where um you know sandoval talks about Latinidad being, you know, the what unites us being the language. And, you know, Leti um, tells him, no, it's, it, was it Leti, Rodrigo? I can't, I. It was uh, Daniela. It was Dan Daniela. It was Daniela. Daniela, Daniela. And yeah. she says, no, es la lucha. Ooh. Right? And that kind of just, Fire. bam, that describes the show for me. Right, because that's what the show represents to so many of us is it talks about, it shows us la lucha and all of you do such an amazing job of just showing us the journey of each one of those characters within la lucha. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again. I know we've been you know, dripping with thank yous, but really it's heartfelt. We love you guys, we love the show. Uh, we will do our best as a community to make sure that everybody knows about it. We will be having, you know, watch parties. We'll be doing some Twitter storms and some Instagram storms and just making sure that our communities know that this is a show that we need to watch and we need to support because absolutely we talk about it all the time. We complain about it. Well, here's the show that's solving that for us and we need to do our part as the community that supports it. So I want to thank you all again for joining us. And for those in the audience, if you are not following La Casita Verde at the top, which is our club, please make sure you follow that club so that you get alerted to these types of rooms and so that you get alerted when we do our Twitter storms and our watch parties and all that fun stuff. Um, so again, muchas, muchas gracias to everybody for joining us. I hope you have a beautiful, blessed night. 
And uh, we're going to go ahead and shut down the room in the next 15 seconds. Feel free to unmute and say your goodbyes. Adios. Adios, Thanks, adios, guys. adios. Thank gracias. you, everyone. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you Let so much. Bye, you. everybody. Click on the link, y'all. Click on the link. Watch the show. Follow the link. Follow ciao, the ciao. Show. Check it out. Much love. Besos.